In this section, we're going to start going beyond the rigid rotator harmonic oscillator model. And by that, I mean we're going, to we're going to learn about the limitations of this model, limitations in terms of predicting actual spectra. And then we'll, we'll talk about what that teaches us about the actual physical reality that we're trying to simulate or trying to understand. So let's start by looking back at this real rotational vibrational spectrum that we considered before, where we have, again, we have our R branch to the right, and we have our P branch to the not right or to the left. And one of the things that we were marked on, but we didn't spend too much more time on, is that the rigid rotator harmonic oscillator approximation predicts the line spacings between all of these peaks will be the same. But if you notice in the R branch, as you go towards the right, they appear to get closer together. And in the P branch, as you go further left, they appear to get further apart. So actually, we can make this really clear by drawing on top of this and then trying to superimpose, right? So that is the distance between the last two peaks in the P branch. And this is what it looks like when you try to superimpose that over the last two peaks in the R branch. And so it's a significant change in the spacing between the two states. And so this is telling us immediately that there is something missing in our rigid rotator harmonic oscillator model. And the thing that's missing is labeled vibration rotation interaction. So let's think about what goes into our rotational model that could be wrong. So really the only input that we have that we have any control over is the moment of inertia. Remember the moment of inertia was written like this. So i is equal to mu times l squared, where mu is the reduced mass, and l is the bond distance between the two atoms in the diatomic. Mu only depends on the masses of the two atoms involved, and since masses are fixed during chemical reactions, masses of atoms anyways, then we don't expect mu to change really for any reason at all. L, on the other hand, this is the bond distance. This is a dynamical property, right? So this is, we, we have a model to describe this distance already. This is the harmonic oscillator model. And so this is maybe the, the first candidate to think that we might be missing something by looking at what's happening with L squared. And so let's think about what this looks like from the model that we normally use to think about this vibration, which is the harmonic oscillator model. So, so we always wrote the harmonic oscillator models in terms of the variable x. And if we remember, we wrote that x was equal to l minus l naught, where l here is the actual distance of the bond, and l naught is the equilibrium distance. So we can rewrite this. Since what we care about is l, we can rewrite this as x plus l naught. And we can think about what happens to L in different uh, as, as we add more energy into our oscillator. Okay, so your your first thought for what this could be, right? So this this L squared is sort of assuming a single fixed length, which it, we know is not true. And so we have to think about different ways to approach this idea with rigorous quantum mechanical ideas. And so your first thought might be to look at the expectation value of L and then square that. So you take the average value of L and square it. Okay, and in spectroscopy, we're always doing, we're always looking at transitions between two different eigenstates or between multiple different eigenstates. And so let's restrict ourselves to looking at expectation values of specific eigenstates. So let's put these little n subscripts that indicate that we're looking at the nth state when we're looking at, at what's happening here. Oh, okay, but, but this already exposes that this can't be what's going on, because as we proved in the harmonic oscillator section, this expectation value of x over a single eigenstate, over any eigenstate, is always zero, which means that the average value of l is always equal to l naught for every single eigenstate. The average value of L doesn't change as we change the, the quantum number of the oscillator. But what about L squared, right? Because it's L squared that goes into this. And so what if instead of looking at the average value, we look at the average of the square? 
And so now in this case, we look at average value of L squared for different quantum numbers. If we uh, replace L squared with x plus L naught squared from over here, And then we can expand this. This turns into the expectation value of x squared plus two times the expectation value of x times L naught plus just L naught squared. Okay, and this can get simplified. You notice that, so turning those two times the expectation value of x, which is a variable, and L naught, which is just a constant, and so whatever this is, we can pull the L naught out front. And now again, remember that this expectation value of x was always zero. And so that means that this term will just wipe away. And so what you get at the end, and we'll, we'll erase this in a second, is that this is equal to the expectation value of L squared plus L naught squared. So, so we know from previous problems that the expectation value of X squared is not zero, and furthermore, it changes as N changes. And so what that means is that as you put more energy into the oscillator, the average value of X squared will change and therefore the average value of L squared, which goes into the moment of inertia, will also change. And so in these spectra where we're exciting from the ground state or the harmonic oscillator to the first excited state of the harmonic oscillator, our moment of, inert of inertia will change, and this is what we're not taking into account uh, in, this, in this spectra. Okay, so the simplest way to fix this is to rewrite the eigenenergies of this combined rigid rotator harmonic oscillator model to, to look like this. So the harmonic oscillator part doesn't change. This is still h bar omega n plus one half. But now the moment of inertia depends on the quantum number of the harmonic oscillator. So why don't we reanalyze the energies or the observed wave numbers we would expect for the R branch and the P branch using this updated model where the moment of inertia now depends on the vibrational quantum number. Okay, so we'll make some room first. We're gonna remember the R branch was defined to have delta J equal to plus one. And now to go about simplifying this, let's first again group by these j plus ones. On the first term we'd have would be b1 tilde times j plus two, which comes from this part up here. And the second part we would have is minus b0 tilde j. Now we can go one step further by expanding this as omega tilde plus j plus 1 times, now we have b1 tilde minus b0 times j plus 2b1 tilde. 
Now I'm going to make a quick leap, so stick with me. Okay, so we're going to add and subtract b1 minus b0. And then we'll see what this gets us. So this gets us down here omega tilde plus j plus 1 times. Now, if we combine this first, this added one with this term up here, this turns now into j plus 1 right there. So this is b1 minus b0 j plus 1. Those are tildes. Whereas the second term, where we combine this 2b1 and then minus b1 minus b0, this ends up just giving us, so this together now will just give us b1 plus b0. So then we can finally simplify this all as omega tilde plus b1 plus b0 j plus 1 plus b1 minus b0 j plus 1 squared. Okay, so now let's look at the p branch. Remember the p branch is defined to be delta j is equal to minus 1. So we look at this observed energy again. This will be the energy of vibrational quantum number 1 and rotational quantum number j minus 1 minus the energy at 0 in j. And this is equal to Okay, so the next step is to do the first round of simplification, which will give us omega tilde for the vibrational component. And then again, if we group on the J terms, Okay, we get this, and then again we can group inside of here on the J terms as well. And so if we put this together and simplify, what we get is omega tilde minus b0 plus b1 times j plus b1 minus b0 times j squared. Okay, so these are our two expressions for the R branch and the P branch. So let's go through and and see what this tells us first off. Okay, so the, the first thing that's really important to point out is that if B1 is equal to B0, or in other words, if the moment of inertia and therefore the bond length have absolutely no dependence on the vibrational quantum number, then so that in that point you get B1 is equal to B0. And now all of these terms that depend on the squares drop out, right? So this depends on B1 minus B0, and so this goes to zero. Uh, this term goes to zero. And also when b0 is equal to b1, then this is just equal to 2b, and this is just equal to 2b. And in that case, you would get back exactly the same expressions that we used 
for the pure rigid rotator harmonic oscillator model for these spectra. Okay, so in other words, if you undo the assumption that these Bs can be different, then this gives us back the same original equation that we derived before we allowed these things to change. And that is a crucial sanity check, right? So if we, because if we didn't get the same thing back, that'd be a really good indication that we made a boo-boo somewhere. Okay, so the next thing we need to look at is how these trends change. So let's make a little room and then we can start talking. All right, so now let's talk about what this means in terms of the spectra. So the first thing we need to try to understand is what happens to b of n as a function of n. And so remember that uh, this b of n, the n dependence is really coming from the, the dependence on the bond distance, which will change, or at least the bond distance squared will change, as we put more and more energy into a harmonic oscillator. And so we can simply imagine that if this thing just starts, if you put more energy into a harmonic oscillator, it starts exploring more and more. And so the average value of x squared should get larger and larger. But b of n depends on the moment of inertia, one over the moment of inertia, which has one over l squared in it, which means that, so if we expect the average value of l squared of n to go up as n goes up, then because bn depends on 1 over l squared, we should expect b of n to go down as n goes up. And so what that means is that we would expect b1 to be less than b0, and therefore b1 minus b0 to be a negative number. And so we can define really quick uh, something to help us keep this in mind. So if we take this b1 minus b0, and call this minus alpha e, where now alpha e is a positive number, then this turns into minus alpha e j squared. And over here on the right, we have the same thing. This is minus alpha e tilde j plus one squared. Okay, and now this is enough for us to understand why this, the line spacing is different in the R branch than the P branch. So let's start by talking about the R branch over on the left side, ascent, on the left hand side here. So if you notice, you have these two terms, one's proportional to j plus one, one's proportional to j plus one squared, and they have different signs in the coefficients out front. So b1 plus b0 will always be positive, it's the sum of two positive numbers, and then this minus alpha e will always be negative. And so that means that the spacing between these two lines as j gets larger, gets smaller. All right, so these are all the observed lines, and then they get closer and closer together because these two things have opposite signs. And you can see that in the spectrum up here, right? So in the R branch, these two lines are very close together, uh, a lot closer together than these lines are here, and definitely more than they're on the P branch, and we'll see why that is in a second as well. Okay, so now in the P branch, you look, the, up, the other thing is happening because there's a linear term and the quadratic term have the same sign. So they're both that they're both negative, which means that these two things will act together to make a larger separation uh, up here. Okay, so that, so, and, and that is why in the P branch we have this large separation, or we, we have a growing separation between adjacent lines, whereas in the R branch we have a shrinking separation between the lines. Okay, and the last thing we're going to do with this problem is we're going to introduce a model for how this BN depends on N. Again, this is normally written, this is normally approximated as bn, and we'll put a tilde here, is equal to be tilde minus alpha e tilde n plus one half. And we already noticed from this that we, we basically already used this idea to define alpha, because if you have b1 minus b0, the result of that would just be alpha, but we can convert these equations using this definition. And what we get for the R branch is omega tilde plus two times BE minus alpha E times J plus one, and then minus alpha E tilde times J plus one squared. And similarly, what we get for the P branch then is omega tilde minus b minus alpha e times j, and again minus alpha e tilde j squared. 
Okay, now these two different parameters, so this, this turns the BN into a two parameter system. You have this BE and the alpha. And by fitting these things to appropriate functions, we can then fully determine the BEs and the alphas just based on this vibration and rotation interaction. So if you notice, this is one more thing that we can learn about the vibrational problem by analyzing rotational spectra. More specifically, we can get some estimate of the dependence of L squared, or the dependence of the bond distance squared, from looking at the line spacing, and in particular the variable line spacing for the rotation vibrational spectrum. Okay, so that is everything we're gonna talk about in terms of the uh, this particular type of vibration rotation interaction or vibration rotation mixing. In the next section, we'll talk about one more important interaction, which is called centrifugal distortion.